What's up, guys? What's up, everybody? You guys here for a very special episode. We have a very special episode today, folks. Hi, Shelby. Hi, Shelby. <laughs> Good to see everybody. We got Derek Nance on the line today. We're going to be doing a little uh, conversation about food and life. I'm going to finish up my butter here. So stay tuned, guys. Don't leave. This is going to be a goodie. A little Christmas special. I'm just waiting a couple minutes here for Derek to show up and um, we will get this show on the road, guys. Hope everybody's having a good holiday weekend. Eating some good food, hanging out with family, enjoying life. That's what it's all about. I just ate. Uh, Raw ground beef, and I got some raw heart here as well, and some butter. So, this is uh, I'm gonna be eating this with Derek here, but uh. This is some uh, raw deer heart right here. Very tasty looking little morsel there, fresh. Ready to go. Do I think my way of living life is the one way or do you support the idea of do what works for you? But I do believe this was our original intended natural diet. Sorry, hopefully we don't have connection issues here. I believe this was our original intended natural diet of raw meat. Um, we can add stuff if we need, like fruit and, you know, um, things like that. But for the most part, I think we're meant to sustain on raw meat. And raw dairy is very delicious as well, and it's also nutritious, so. But for the most part, I think people don't do very well on like heavy plant diets. So that's kind of like the key. The fundamental is just to be eating a lot of meat. <clears throat> you can eat cooked food. You can be pretty healthy on cooked food. But raw meat just takes it to like a whole different level of health and energy and mental clarity and balance. So for people that are looking for that, raw meat might be... Um, it's an option to look for. Hopefully this is the real Derek Nance. What's up, buddy? Greetings, friend. Hey, man. man. I wasn't sure if that was you. I thought that might have been a troll. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we keep it down low. There ain't any trolls out there, are there? Oh, no, not on the internet. No. Never met no, one. We got rid of me years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never met one in my life. But uh, cool, man. So how you been, man? How you been since last time we hung out? I've been good. I'm busy. You know, it's just my busy season. I was trying to get everything done for work, trying to get everything done so I could be here. And uh, we got this, uh, whatever it is, this Arctic blast. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know what you all are doing out there, but we're in the negatives. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get my studio ready for rent and uh, the water froze. Mm -hmm. So I ended up uh, just a couple hours ago crawling under this thing, putting the heater next to the pipes and just trying to get it to thaw out before my guests arrived. Yeah. Uh, finally, right when I was going to give up, the water comes and it starts trickling. It's like, oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, other other than a little bit of ice, everything's good on this end. Yeah, we're getting hammered up here, too. We're at uh, negative 12 yesterday, and um, today we're at about zero. So, All right. looking forward to uh, getting above five or 10 tomorrow. But I saw them like Wyoming there at negative 27 yesterday, which is crazy. All right, we're just preparing for, for the next ice age. We got we got a leg up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll be good. We'll be good, man. Um, so, so cool, man. Um, yeah, I just figured we can just talk about whatever you want, man. If you got something you want to talk about, if you got a topic, or we can just start start kind of just right spit firing wherever you want, man. Oh, there, there's a lot to discuss. So I'd maybe try to keep the first part of it. Uh, focused on you know the diet and the nutrition what we do personally to find our way through the milieu of different dietary choices that we have on the raw meat-based diet so we can i mean what i'm doing is what i've been doing for the last few years you know mostly mutton mm -hmm. so i got my raw mutton and uh, i saw that deer heart a little earlier and i uh, thought there's a little mutton heart oh nice <laughs> yeah yeah. Just a little chunk. You see the fat layer on it. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty nice looking, man. Uh huh. Looks delicious. And then uh, I don't know. I started. I ate about half of it earlier, but here's a sheep brain. Mm hmm. So I've been fueling up. So I've got a little bit of the sheep brain. Mm hmm. Yeah. Your brain is so good. I just had some brain yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not no Derek Nance high quality sheep brain, <laughs> but uh, it's it's decent. It's decent, hmm. but uh, man, do you still get? I've asked you this before, probably, but do you still get like crazy dreams when you eat brains? Uh, yeah, <laughs> do you like dreams yeah. that long, long dreams that just meander through scene after scene? Right, <laughs> you, right. Sometimes yeah, you wake like up and you wake up and you're like, that was wild, and then you snooze some more and you just go jump right back into it. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's really good. You can just feel those neurons being replenished and you know just driving forward whatever the vision is yeah yeah i feel like that too man and like the feeling that i get after eating brain after a meal is like it's probably one of the best feelings i can think of of a raw food personally like it's just super content and like a little a mild euphoria mm -hmm. you know just real easy and like level-headed like the next day usually is just things seem to go well the mind seems to work very well and a lot of and so it carries over you know from after you sleep into the next day and i think it's something that periodically i don't recommend people just get 50 pounds of brain and just eat nothing but brain because i think you can imbalance yourself in many ways especially if you don't know what you're getting mm -hmm. and you have no idea you know what the quality is but yeah if you're pretty sure of the quality and you've done this for a while you can kind of go on instinct and mm -hmm. you know I'll, I'll crack open a brain when you know the instinct that drives me to it or just uh sometimes on a whim but I, I go through a whole animal and uh I was going through an animal like once a month like a 130 pound sheep and you know when you strip it down off the carcass you know you might get about 60 pounds a meat or so and so like a couple pounds a day but now, like, uh, I've been getting these good animals, and I've been working hard and eating more. So I'm going through an animal probably every three weeks. Oh, wow. And, and so, but, you know, for each animal, you know, there's a brain, there's a liver, there's kidneys. And so I just eat the organs in portion with the animal. So I get the whole animal nutrition in rough, roughly the proportions that are needed, you know, for optimal health. Sure. Yeah, that's that's interesting you bring that up because I've been experimenting with that myself ever since I had a buddy go out and <clears throat> kill the deer. He does this once a year. He'll kill a deer and bring it back and um, he'll give me the organs because they don't eat it. They don't eat the liver. They don't eat the heart. Yeah. So, but I noticed that like if I eat too much of that, those organs, like it doesn't seem like it digests 
perfect like it does normal food and i don't know if you have any insight on that but i was thinking that possibly like the wild game organs are just stronger or it's detox anymore or it's just like too much nutrition at once and you're not supposed to eat a pound of heart or a pound of liver in one sitting like what do you think about that yeah 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 i think that there's a limit to the organs like heart there's different amino acids and i i used to be up on it more to tell you what the type of proteins that are in the heart that if you get too much of it can be a little bit of protein overload and the liver of these uh grazing animals yeah they have such a wide diet that there's accumulation of things in there that not necessarily toxic in and of themselves but if you get more than a certain threshold your body will tell you that you've had enough mm -hmm. and so i've had good deer liver i've had bad deer liver and so it's just yeah. on the animal and I, I cut my teeth on deer because i was eating deer meat before i really transitioned into raw and uh, i had a buddy of mine that i used to work with and like he he hit one with his truck he hit one like a big 180 pound female just huge uh and a called it to my house like late at night. It's like, yeah, and his, den his fender is all bent up, but it was fresh. It was a big animal. So it was like, okay. And so this was probably just a few months before I really transitioned into raw. And so I cut it open and then I actually ate a piece of the heart raw because I was reading the online forums and about the Native Americans. It's like, oh yeah, you can definitely eat the heart raw. So that was kind of one of my first foods that I ate raw mm -hmm. was eating the heart. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was trying to marinate and cook all the deer meat. And when you cook deer meat, it's tough and it's a chore and it's really not the best meat if you're accustomed to eating beef, you know, all the time. Yeah. So I really wasn't a big fan of it. Plus, it's really lean and it's hard to get enough fat on a deer based diet. Yeah. You know, about the rabbit starvation of a lot of the settlers who just wouldn't eat the fat. You have to eat the gut fat, the suet, you know, the brains, the marrow, you can scrape enough fat off of a deer carcass to make a, you know, low carb keto meat based work, but it's a, you got to eat nose to tail. Mm -hmm. And uh, some early on into the diet, uh, see, I wasn't as uh, well off as I was, as I am now. Uh, mm -hmm. I was making about $15 an hour living in a two bedroom trailer, supporting three kids mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely poor. I mean, we had winters where the electric bill was $400 a month because we had this bad electric furnace that was inefficient. So I was struggling. Mm -hmm. And sometimes around hunting season, I'd call the butcher shops, a lot of the local processors, and uh, they would just have leftovers from the hunters. And you'd be surprised. Like these hunters, they, they like the back strap and they like a few of the rump roast and they'll pretty much give away the rest. Yeah. You know, some of these trophy hunters. And so there's deer meat out there if you if you want to go look for it and so uh, yeah i went around and uh, i think i even posted a craigslist ad once and i got a hunter that responded to me from a few counties over it's like yeah i got a couple i just got them and i went down there and uh one of them was like a little uh fawn it's just, just a little i mean tender as can be you know it's almost like the lamb of deer and i don't recommend going out hunting baby deer but this guy did mm -hmm. and uh it was absolutely delicious, like one of the best deer I've ever had. <laughs> and so, you know, I've, I found a way to scavenge, you know, when I was uh, struggling financially. And, and deer meat will work, you know, especially during hunting season when there's a glut. And if you know somebody who hunts, if you don't want to go hunting yourself, you can find it. Or you can mm -hmm. get a couple permits and, and learn how to hunt and get your own. It's a, yeah. a go-to, especially for desperate times, because you never know. Yeah can't always get that good ten dollar a pound grass-fed meat at the market yep yeah i agree man yeah it's good and it's like one of the coolest uh it's one of the coolest things to have someone like gift you something that they hunted you know like mm -hmm. give you the heart and give you the liver and like be able to wash it off and just you know trim it up and eat it and it's it's a cool thing man it's something there's definitely something primal in that too even if you don't hunt it yourself if you know a hunter and you just get the meat from them that's that's like the next best thing i think but but yeah, it's interesting about the, the wild game, man. Like I've been kind of reconsidering like, like eating a pound of liver at a time. Like, do you ever do that? Do you ever just eat like one pound of liver for a meal? No, I, I, I don't because, uh, you know, my primary go-to is a uh, mutton mm -hmm. and the liver themselves on a mutton is like maybe two pounds. And, mm -hmm. uh, I try to ration it because, uh, 
I don't know, I'll just feel better if I ration it throughout. When I first get a deer, uh, a sheep, I'll, I'll eat, yeah, you know, a good portion, maybe a good three or four ounces at a time. And I'm not saying that it's not okay. You could probably do good to eat, you know, a pound of liver, just go full liver king if you had access to resources. Yeah. But even though I'm better off, I still don't have the, that type of resources. <laughs> I'd love to experiment. I'd love to have that type of cash where I could actually go out to the best farms and maybe buy an entire cow liver and, and gorge myself. But yeah, where I'm at right now, I just, I kind of go with what works. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to kind of lean towards that too. Cause like I was, I was going like, you know, straight liver King on it. But obviously before liver King ever came on the scene, you and I were doing what we were doing, but um, just for the sake of being funny. Yeah. I would eat I like to, time. I like to give him a hard time now that you know he's he's come out. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. He's, I mean, he came, out, he came out of the closet. But I, mean, like, I mean, it's 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 a big elephant in the room. It's like, how could you have not seen that coming? I mean, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just one yeah. of those things. Well, for me, it was it was like his abs mm -hmm. and his head. You know, like he had kind of like an abnormally large head, and so that to me was. Uh, Ind indicative to me that he was on human growth hormone and then the ab growth to me indicated he was obviously on human growth hormone but people ask me all the time on my channel what do you think about liver king what do you think about liver king and like i was kind of back and forth on it at first i was like oh he's obviously on steroids and then i kind of went back and i was like you know what you know i don't know Oh, maybe he's not maybe you can really get that big but but i always lean towards he was and then um but when it comes down to it though like when it comes to these like media personalities like I try not to judge him because it's like I've never met him, mm -hmm. and he honestly seems like he seems like a really cool guy, and uh, his, his message, his fundamental message, is like is really good. But uh, he, yeah, he messed up. But like, hey, we can forgive him, and you know, he's he's spreading a good message. But then there's the whole like, is the guy controlled opposition, right? Like, you know, is he brought on the scene in order to turn people away from raw meat? Because now we got millions of people watching this guy going, oh raw meat isn't that good for you it's actually steroids you know no it's it's, it's that guilt by association and uh i give him the benefit of the doubt i tried to reach out to him i've tried to send the messages through his emails like i know ways that we can go you know i could be a scout for him like he gets these supplemental you know sources i could go out to the ranches and i could tell him what i think i could have a business proposition mm -hmm. and if he wants a road to redemption he needs to talk to us I know. You know, people like <laughs> us who have been, you know, doing it raw and uh, completely natural, maybe we could give them a little bit of advice. And there's right. other people out there, other forebears, like a, a, you've heard of Armand Tani. Um, He's a bodybuilder from the 1950s. You could oh, look, yeah, 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 yeah. I have heard of him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so like in the 1950s, he was eating about a couple kilograms of raw meat every day, completely natural. Mm -hmm. Like you don't get to that freakish level physique but you get functional strength and i don't really think you need to go beyond that honestly no. so like here's a man who was completely natural lived to be in his 90s and was eating a couple pounds of raw meat every day during the heyday of the bodybuilding you know, the natural bodybuilding era and so there's people out there that are prime examples of how you can do it and you can do it natural mm -hmm. you don't have to take it up to that new level where everybody is a uh, you know, using artificial supplements, but I reach out my hand to him. It's like, come join us. Can you imagine the resources this man has? Right. Like he could fund studies, independent studies where we could actually put this to the test mm -hmm. and I could be a scout for him or other people that, you know, have the experience and know what they're looking for. And we could set something up that would really provide scientific evidence i know that's what everybody's glomming on to well there's no evidence so it's because we don't have any funding we don't have any right. magnet that's going to drop a couple million dollars on us to, so that we can go out to get the best food we can get and then volunteers that are willing to live this way i mean that's yeah. basically what it would take yeah so that's my that's my reach out to him. But honestly, his message is is wonderful though the primal tenants <laughs> i mean i've lived this I've lived this yeah, way sure. the last 12 years. Fresh air, sunshine. I mean, all that's sure. great. Well, I was ready. I mean, I was ready to, to obviously judge the guy. Anytime you see some dude on like YouTube that's, you know, 
authorized by the mainstream and he blows up as quick as he does you know there's like what's the catch right so like i started watching his videos but what got me to like him was when he was doing like a tour of his house and he was talking about how everything was like emf free and nobody has cell phones and all the cell phones were. i was like okay this guy's actually like he's not just trying to eat raw meat and be a tough guy he's actually trying to like live like a natural lifestyle in like all areas you know which i can totally relate with and i know you do too it's like you got the the red light the red light lamps and you do all sorts of other stuff besides eating raw meat you know so yeah so i I respect him for what what he's doing on all that all those other fronts i think that it's absolutely great that he's promoting it and that he's getting other people interested in it so it's not an all-or-nothing proposition the raw meat diet what i can say is maybe he can be an example of how raw meat-based nutrition can mitigate some of the negative effects of those people who use uh, those illegal uh, supplements. Because honestly, like for him to be doing as well as he is, there has to be some merit to the raw meat. There has to be some merit to the raw liver, the raw testicles, all that stuff for you. And it, it wouldn't work. The fact of the matter is, that he's in a good shape as he is and able to you know, do all these feats of strength, maybe there's merit to the raw meat. And it that shouldn't be t- taken away just because he's using other things on the side. Yes, and so- true. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the first thing I thought of when I heard Liver King was, uh, and I saw him eating liver, and I thought of steroids, I was like, oh, this guy, he's taking steroids and he's trying to prevent liver damage, so he's eating raw liver, you know? That's the first thing yeah. I thought of. Yeah, and he can mitigate that damage. I, I'm, I'm convinced because there's a lot of these uh, bodybuilders that, you know, just do the powdered supplement protein and they seem to be able to hold up all right. You know, Arnold's still yeah. alive. You yeah, know, yeah. He, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it, it would be a good experiment. But if you're going to do that and you're going to put yourself out in the public, you have to be more honest. You have to be honest about what you're doing and that way people will have – the information they need to make proper informed consent decisions on what they're going to do with their nutritional choices. Yeah. Yeah. That's true, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I wish him the best, man. I saw something recently. It said that he's claiming that he's going to, he's going to try to do it all natural. Mm-hmm. So that, that would, that would be cool. You know, hit us up. get this to get this to liver King, hit us up. Like I'm a friend. Exactly. Like we can do things. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody <laughs> out there if you're watching this go send this to liver king dm him tag him and uh tell him to get with us man we've been doing this for a while we can help him out yeah we're just poor working boys we ain't got the resources but <laughs> if if he wants to give us a little, little charity uh, i can uh-huh. start his honor yeah yeah <laughs> for sure man yeah i'll raise him the most prime bulls you wouldn't believe mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i'm already going after his beard i'm gonna have a bigger beard than him I you would have you would had me beat unless and um if you didn't shave it off. I I'm gonna do it someday, but like uh, my girlfriend says, it's like a a certain field. Like when it gets to a certain level, she feels like it's just like taking over the room. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to balance it out. You know, it's, 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 yeah, it's its own entity. Yeah, yeah. Well, my my fiance says she loves it, and so I'm just gonna grow it out. I'm gonna be like, hey, you're the one that told me to do it, so. Right on. You can't complain. But yeah, cool, man. So yeah, I just wanted to, I had some questions for you, man. If you don't mind, I can run some things by you and just kind of get your ideas on some stuff. Sure. Um, the first thing I want to talk about. So what do you think about one of the biggest questions that I get, man, is about drinking blood. And people always say, why does it say in the Bible that we shouldn't drink blood? What's your take on that, man? Why do you think that that's even in the Bible in the first place. And, and what's your, what's your take on like the energy of the animal being in the blood and that potentially being like a negative thing or do you think? Throw it away. And they, make sure, they make sure nobody's the blood. It's almost like it's taboo. And I don't know if it goes back to superstition or some other type of a, a cult that where they demonized it while you know the priests were sitting there drinking blood in the back while you know they forbid it from the peasants if if it was that kind of thing or 
maybe there's a lot of stigma during the barbarian days because uh you know barbarian hordes you know of blood drinking savages would uh havoc so the correlation between blood drinking and savagery might have created a superstition for taboo even though some of the most peaceful tribes you know the reindeer herders or uh, the maasai even well they have warriors too but you know they there's peaceful people that have drinking blood throughout history but then there's the aztecs <laughs> You know, so maybe there's a stigma behind it just because certain groups of people were being very abusive and brutal and they associated with the blood drinking or the Dionysian cults, you know, the, the blood orgies and, and drug taking that they did back in the Macedonian era. So there's a lot of there's a lot of dark history that probably we'll never be able to sort out, you know, why the taboos were placed upon, you know, raw meat in general and then to a greater extent blood, but on a nutritional scientific level, the nutrition's there. It has all the electrolytes, all the minerals mm -hmm. uh, in the proper portions and the heme iron. It has everything that the body needs. There's no reason not to consume the blood as long as it comes from a healthy animal. Yeah, I, I tend to agree, man. It just doesn't make sense that uh, God would um, create an animal and make everything available to eat nose to tail uh but not the blood you know it doesn't make any sense uh, there's a lot of stuff in the bible that doesn't make perfect sense to me either whether it was lost in translation or, or whatever you know yeah but, um, yeah i was i don't I, take was every, I don't take all that for literal like i i really do uh believe that there are divinely inspired human beings and perhaps the gospels of jesus christ were inspired by the legend of a man, but the reality of the Gospels, the reality of what these so-called apostles wrote into Scripture, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt. I think that you can't take everything literally because uh, there's a lot of symbolism, I think, that wasn't quite translated. Oh, I agree. I agree, man. It's pretty deep. I think, I mean, I personally think a lot of those were written under the influence of uh, some some uh, plant medicines and... Well, yeah, we can we can go on a whole other trope about. Uh, okay, so how do you turn water into wine? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of tea concoctions I could think of. Right. And what would what would make a man walk? Depicted with the the halo. <laughs> so you can go into that trope of history, where. Uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that was never written down. Just like there's a lot going on here and now that people don't disclose because in polite society, it's not good to talk about. <laughs> well, I think it goes back to like, I like talking about controversial stuff because it seems like that's the only way you can get to the truth of things. And um, so like, it kind of goes back to what you're saying about blood drinking and priests, like maybe the priests were drinking the blood behind the scenes, but not letting the peasants drink it. I think that that's what was going on with priests back in the day is they were taking substances, different mind altering substances, but they weren't allowing like the lesser folk to do it. So they were having divine experiences and they thought they could maybe translate these to other people, which I kind of understand. I don't think that's necessarily evil. I think maybe some of those substances are um, specifically for like certain, certain people that can understand the experiences and maybe translate them. But, but I think at a certain point it became like a control mechanism you know and then they started uh you know the christian church started demonizing plant medicines and psychedelics and um you know basically that's how it got to where it is today yeah and it got to such a point where they were burning women at the stake because they had an herb garden and they were using you know the natural herbs and herb craft and they that's the witch and so yeah they were completely off the deep end when it comes to de demonizing some of these you know naturalistic earth practices that our ancestors have mm -hmm. developed eons eons before the beginning of history mm -hmm. and so it, it's it's a tragedy but it's also understandable because you're talking about control mechanisms and people who are undergoing these experiences and living in a more natural way they have no interest in being controlled so they have to be put under a set of rules and prohibited from living a certain way in order for them to adopt, you know, this uh, religion, this form of life or whatever the, the new uh, civilization of the day demands. Yeah. 
So there's a, it's, it's a constant battle. And I'm not saying that civilization is evil for doing it, for suppressing us and for uh, domesticating us because it serves a purpose. It serves the function of civilization and all these wonderful things that we have now. But it comes at a price, you know, a sacrifice of our primal nature. And so what I'm interested in more than anything is just trying to find that balance point, that way to actually experience being fully human but still having an eye toward the future and saying, okay, this is where we need to go, but not so fast. What are we in such a hurry about to leave behind all these uh, ancestral ways of life, which led to our evolution. It led to the evolution of the human mind. Like we don't just have to leave it all behind on a whim because some finding a middle ground and maybe bringing back some of these practices, ancient forgotten practices, simple things like eating your meat raw <laughs> and, and a fresh air, sunshine, and a, just yep. ways of life that aren't completely tied into this control system that seems to be being built for us. Yeah. Yeah, it's important, man. Yeah. I mean, I think it's uh, there's a big awakening going on right now because we're just getting – our health is just getting crushed, you know, from just all the, just uh, the Western lifestyle in general, modern medicine, working inside, artificial lighting, mm. artificial clothes, bad air, like people are just dying, man. And so I think people are starting to just, their natural instincts are starting to come out and they're starting to wake up and kind of figure out what, what works best for us. You know, I'm really surprised on how many people are waking up to this raw meat thing. Like, um, you know, I get a lot of people on my channel talking to me about it. There's a lot of people out there. It's not just like a few, you know, fringe like weirdos. It's a lot of like really cool, you know, normal people are out here doing this, you know? Yeah. It's and really I, yeah, I found that two different walks of life. And sometimes, you know, some of our pioneers might not have been the most, uh, PR friendly. I mean, and a lot of them have been canceled in the past. But what happens is, is some of these outliers, like Sverige, uh, would actually wake people up who would never in a million years find their way to a channel like ours. Uh -huh. But because of the outrage, because of the all the outlandish things, you know, their interest was piqued. And the next thing you know, they're studying objectively into the, the the claims made by some of these people that were uh, maybe banned on the social media networks now yeah and so they, they've set loose you know this this interest and it's 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 gaining uh, force it, i think it was actually hitting a peak right before the the, the covid lockdowns uh, i was getting media requests left and right from a they wanted to fly me and my family out to uh, California for some reality show and I'm not really big on reality shows but yeah. all expenses paid getting the message out go right ahead and yeah. there was documentary crews from uh, the UK and another film company from uh, New York was set to come out like uh, early uh, 2019 and then it was just all shut down by the end of that year <laughs> and uh -huh. all, all the interest just you gone mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I yeah. think recently uh yeah, I was contacted by My Strange Addiction, and uh, I was all set to film. Uh, they they said that, yeah, we like your story, and then all we got to do is a background check. And uh, mm -hmm. apparently, I didn't pass the muster. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so I told about my friend. I told so I'm not quite sure if it was the same producers that reached out to you or... Um. I can't you, remember. Do you remember their names? No, I don't. I was on a couple conference calls. Did you talk? I don't know. Did you talk to a guy named Joel at all? Mm -mm. Joel Nassan? Yeah, yeah. I think I talked to him over the phone. Okay. I didn't do like a yeah. with him. Yeah, that was the same guy for nope. sure. Yeah, I think it was the same people. Yeah. So yeah. So I, I mean, I, think I, I got on the show because they they wouldn't let you on. Uh, That's which is crazy. Which is crazy. <laughs> Your episode would have been way more interesting, but. That's basically what I'm getting at. You know, I'm just alluding to how, how you managed to get on. But, like, I passed, right. I passed the baton. Like, I got a lot going on in my life right now. Maybe it's not my time to to hit the mainstream. So, yeah. But I, not yet. 
you know, not, not yet, maybe. But like, you know, like they say, like some of the greatest, most brilliant people out there, like they don't hit their peaks in their life till they're in their 50s and 60s and 70s. You know, like that's when some of like people's most brilliant work goes out there is like towards the the last third of the life. You know, so, so all I got to do is survive another decade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I, think up there, think I can get up there. 25 years of raw experience and you know i might have a few gray hairs and it might make me look a little more wise and respectable <laughs> and then i can go on the i can go on the ted talk tour and all that stuff yeah yeah for sure man i mean we'll always be in contact and we could always there's always going to be room for collaborations between us and there's always, there's going to be more people popping up too so we can you know form a little tribe and do some fun stuff man there's a lot there's a lot I want to be able to discuss and there's very few people that I can actually discuss it with that I enjoy having conversations with. I think I've been kind of blacklisted by a lot of the other primal people in the community or other people like Sverage had his channel cut. I think the primal edge a lot of their old videos, the interviews with me have been you know swiped from the internet. Huh. Like so it's almost like I'm being disappeared on some level and a I mean, not deliberately. It's like bot algorithm stuff, I believe, and maybe these robo flags that have been going up. <laughs> and there's people out there, even I want to shout out to, does anybody know what happened to Milk Jar? Like, I don't, think it, I don't think anybody knows. I've heard some conspiracies out there, but I can't remember if I heard anything about that guy recently or not. I think he's alive, though. Is he? Like, I think so. Well, I don't know. Completely disappeared. Like, he was living in the Ukraine, right? He was living in the Ukraine. Last time I heard of him, he was uh, he was like producing some like really weird music on his channel. Did you hear that stuff? Mm -hmm. That stuff was crazy, man. Uh, it was interesting, really interesting. But he was doing that, and that's the last I heard of him, man. And my point is that you know his channel was canceled, and he is blacklisted on social media, and he's just basically unpersoned. And then he lives in a part of the world where his views could easily get him in trouble oh. and so, so yeah we have this technological matrix that we're being built and then people out there like him just get completely silenced radio silence and like we don't know where they are i know <laughs> and it's and one of them doing that they're, they're doing that to everybody and i'm i'm completely shadow banned like i'm completely off the algorithm mm -hmm. totally like i'm at eleven thousand followers and uh like in a month, I'll have like three to four hundred unfollows and like five hundred follows. So it doesn't make any sense that like four hundred people are unfollowing me every month. So they're like dropping people off my channel all the time, and uh, my YouTube has been stuck at like five thousand or whatever. And uh, nobody finds my channel unless you're searching directly for raw meat or it's like word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So I'm completely off the algorithm. That's what they've done with me. Um, I'm really surprised they haven't like scrubbed me yet because they've given me flags. I had last year, I had um, two flags and like three flags and you're out, I believe. But they gave me two flags and it was like really ridiculous, like trivial stuff. Like I said, so I said to someone like pasteurized milk is trash. And they said it was like hate speech. And so they gave me a flag. And then they gave me another flag for posting something about vaccines. And so I was hanging off the edge there for like six months. I was like, my channel could be gone. But for some reason they've laid off of me you know, and I now I had the opportunity to like, you know, the doctor's show saw me and like, you know, strange addictions got a hold of me and like, you know, some other people through my Instagram. So it's like they're allowed. I don't know what they're trying to do with me. I think they might like, like me for some reason, because maybe because of some of my, my more liberal views on other things. You know, I, I think I don't know. I don't know what what they're thinking about me, man, but they haven't scrubbed me yet. They, they just recently scrubbed Sverage. They recently just scrubbed. Uh, the raw meat experiment. I don't know if you ever checked his channel yeah. out, uh, but yeah, yeah, that guy, he, he's really funny, man, but he, he's like a, he's like a genius, like uh, internet marketer, meme maker. And he found a way to like get 150,000 followers in a matter of months, just eating raw meat in one minute videos. So he, ha he has the algorithm like totally figured out mm -hmm. and he slipped in there before the robots could, you know, scan and detect him. And then they detected him and freaking lasered his channel off you know yeah so maybe you're walking that razor's edge and they allow you just enough 
you know, leeway to have your channel, but not enough to broadcast it out. And maybe that's the best of both worlds. Like that's what we have to work with now. <laughs> so yeah. let's see yeah. how we can go with it. You know, we'll see what we can do with our discussion today yeah. and see how far we push it. And maybe if they'll even allow it to be uploaded to YouTube, I'm not sure how much you're following the YouTube thing now, but they seem to have backed off a little bit. Maybe with all the other craziness in the world, so the bots are focused somewhere else now. <laughs> Just, yeah exactly so. it's always shifting man you know first it was on covid stuff then it was on vaccine stuff now it's on uh russian ukraine stuff you know you say anything good about russia they're scrubbing your videos and you know they send emails out to content creators on youtube telling them they can't say anything positive about russia on there otherwise they'll demonetize them so it's it's like yeah it's a little more covert now i, I love russian people i mean they're great <laughs> See, they're going to already demonetize. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But what is the agenda? Like, there's an agenda to keep us separated from each other. So, like, there's radio silence in Ukraine, so we can't really speak directly to the Ukrainian people. There's radio silence in China and the Russia. I mean, there's language barriers as well, but it just seems like the, the tech industry is putting these firewalls up between we the people, just the average working people from one country to the next, and then we're being sold stories about how we need to hate that other person and how they're plotting against us. And this is the same narrative that's been going on for the last hundred years of totalitarianism, you know, since the first and second world wars. And it's just being played out again. Yeah, I said it. Yeah. <laughs> so we have any diplomat any statesman that goes out and will, will say something like that and get the message across to the other side we don't want to go to war we don't want to hate we don't want to have to silence and censor other people come join our party and if you don't like our party have your own party just live and let live but that kind of message of peace and love those types of people if they get any type of a foothold in the, the you know power structure bye bye you know, I mean, they're like, they're not long for this world. Yeah. And yeah. So I have a message. I just don't know how much I'll be able to do to take it, you know, forward. And I, all I can do is maybe try to focus more on the nutrition and what I do. And I might be able to inspire others to live a better, more productive, wholesome yeah. life. <laughs> and yeah. all through the grassroots. And that's maybe where we need to work. And then, yeah, that big picture thing over there, it's just, it might be too much. <laughs> Yeah I, think, yeah, I think it is, man. I, and I'm, I'm exactly, I'm right with you, man. Like, I, uh, I think we're in the same kind of ballpark. And like, I think it's obviously like, if God is showing us what our path is, it's clearly this raw meat thing. However, we landed here, whatever windy road that we took to get here, this is where we're at. And we're obviously outliers. And um, we're obviously like meant to do this. So yeah, I just think like the whole stay in your lane thing is like really important. You know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water and uh, do something that can sabotage, you know, the project that you have going on over here. And so, yeah, man, I think, you know, I think the same way you do, like I feel sometimes just talking about like vitamins and nutrients and minerals gets boring. And I want to talk about religion and government and you know psychology and the human mind and like i want to get into all sorts of other stuff spirituality and demons and angels and i want to talk about everything right but you know i think um i think like focusing on one thing is important you know so and uh, yeah that happened to us uh, i was on this raw paleo forum for years and uh we would discuss everything in life because you know at a certain point you know diet is not everything and so you could have an affinity group with people that live like you live and then we can talk about our ideas and maybe where we think differently and it was great like from 2012 to about 2015 and 16 there was these lively discussions with mm -hmm. people at all over the world people from different walks of life and then somewhere around 2016, this orange man came in, and all of a sudden, everybody, it, it, we're talking nutritional forms. We're talking about <laughs> these other out-of-the-way backwater places where you think that you could just leave all that behind. But no, it became apparent that you had to pick sides. And then if you said something that was politically offensive, you had moderators banning people <laughs> left and right and <laughs> arguing, and then other people just dropping out. 
like voices of reason. There's this guy named Jeff Prusel, who was uh, one of the moderators on the Raw Forum. And uh, he's, uh, I think, from England that was living in Austria, moving back and forth from uh, Italy. He's a Ron Paul libertarian from England. And he was just very, very, you know, interested in all types of other subjects. And he's been living on the raw meat diet for 20 years or more and was a, you know, a, a wise voice. Whenever I had a question, I could go to. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's just disappears. Nobody knows where he is. And it just, this division, it just seems to have gone across all aspects of society, whether you're in the private sector, government, family, and it just to see it happen. And this incrementally, you know, from 2016 and then the COVID era and then now whatever this is, I know. you have to, you, you have to be blind not to see it. That there's some, some type of an agenda, social engineering experiment ongoing. Yeah. And so when it's going on, it still doesn't affect us if we can step out of it, if we can get that bird's eye view and say, well, I can still organize my life according to my own principles and I can still make basic decisions mm -hmm. for myself. So, you know, sometimes you do have to step back from it. But what it seemed to do for me is it it's took away all those other support systems that I had. I had, you know, some community support. I had a church I'd go to. I had different places where even family where we wouldn't get along and we would disagree for years. And we'd have all types of disagreements, but we'd still come together at least once or twice a year and love each other and forgive each other. Yeah. But all of a sudden, <laughs> now the governor's saying you're not allowed to <laughs> gather. And then half the family is like, no, you, you were not allowed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I, yeah. I, was a, I was just nowhere to go, no one to talk to. And I felt like, you know, I was losing it for a while. And this is me, you know, taking good care of myself, trying to nourish myself and do properly. Just imagine all those people out there I know. that might already be a little unwell and, and unable to cope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they did a hell of a job, man. Whatever kind of psychological operation they did there, man, that was uh, that was a real doozy, you know? <laughs> Nobody's ever seen anything like that before. But it was crazy, man. And I just tried to keep my head down and just, you know, I always knew that the truth would come out in the end. Mm -hmm. And I tried to just not believe anything that I was seeing on the news the best I could. Um, you know, but, but every day someone would come up to me and say, oh, did you freaking hear this was happening? Did you hear that was happening? And I'd be like, yep, yep, yep. It hasn't affected me yet. You know, it hasn't but, affected me yet. But what it's, but, uh, it's really done, what's really done is it's taken a lot of us away from making progress. Like in my research and my own interests and in, in, in collaborating with other people on new theories of nutrition and mm -hmm. biology, it seems to have sidelined everybody to where it's we're in gridlock and we're, we weren't able to make progress in the private sector on a lot of these things that we were advancing naturally we're building our own communities building s parallel economies and all this stuff was going on and so it seems like this is the empire strikes back moment where they you know unleash this to to stop us from being able to build that <laughs> organic holistic small grassroots movement type of future that you know a lot of us really are passionate about yep yeah exactly i mean it's, it was pretty obvious what they did to the businesses too you know i mean they just crushed all the small businesses all the money started getting funneling funneled into amazon i mean just everybody just stayed home and just ordered everything from amazon so that dude made an extra like you know trillion dollars all the small businesses got crushed. All the small restaurants got crushed. Um, it's crazy, man. Yeah, it's crazy. All that shit was nuts. And, I, and we're still, like, seeing, you know, effects from it. Like, I'm looking for a house right now, and houses are crazy. So, like, I'm just waiting on that. Oh, yeah, the interest rates have just shot straight up the last couple of years. We're trying to refinance our house and getting a, you know, loan so that we can pay off our other property. And, mm -hmm. oh, my, it's that's a whole other their subject like we can get into the finance and it's just yeah yeah <laughs> no yeah i mean economics i love i love talking about economics too man it's very interesting stuff but 
this money, the, the mammon, the, the whatever this is, and people don't really question it too much because when you get into it, <laughs> I don't think anybody truly understands how it works. No, it's complicated, man. You can try to think you understand, but yeah, everything is so complicated. Um, but yeah, I had a couple other questions for you, man. Like some, Go for it. Some pretty, some pretty, some pretty like common stuff that I get. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to tell you first off. Let's just jump right into this, man, because this is I haven't told anybody this yet because it was like kind of like a secret um, because it's part of it's part of my strange addictions episode. But like, oh, hey, let me hold it right there. Uh, so I did an episode for a pilot for a animal planet like it was called Extreme Animal Obsessions. And they never went they never went through with the series. It was just the pilot episode. But they did do a series of tests. And so I had blood tests for cholesterol and I had stool samples for oh. parasite. And so I did all that and uh, everything came back normal, but they said I had a parasite. And, oh, really? And th what they said I had was something called blastocystitis. It was this microorganism, like this little pre-algae type creature that didn't bother me at all. <laughs> so right. they, they yeah. can say all they said, but... I don't think it mattered, but I think I heard you said you might have had a parasite on one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I'll tell you about it. So, I'm just, I've been secret about it because I'm not even honestly sure if I'm breaking my contract by talking about the episode, but this was something that I did with a doctor, so I think I can, I can reveal it. So, um, so yeah, part of the episode was, was, um, I'm going to go get like a stool sample, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I did is I went in there and it was like a swab. It was uh, very uncomfortable. I don't recommend anybody ever doing that. But uh, I did it and uh, it came back and I had no parasites, no viruses, anything like that. But they said I had E. coli 0153. Oh, that's so, bad. <laughs> yeah, it's, they said it's the bad E. coli, right? Bad E. So, yeah, part of the episode was, was I basically, um, I sat there in the office with him and I like debated him over that. I basically gave him a lot of really hard questions about what's going on with that, right? Mm -hmm. But so here's some interesting like notes on that. So first off, I'm the first healthy person that's ever walked into that guy's clinic and got a stool sample, right? Yeah. So that's, that's a fact. Everybody else that goes in there is sick, right? So they they don't know necessarily if e coli 0153 exists in healthy people because they don't test healthy people mm -hmm. you know so they find it in sick people which means there's a correlation of e coli 0153 with certain detoxifications of the gastrointestinal system like bloody stools and things like that it may be somehow correlated with that but it doesn't mean that e coli necessarily causes that but they're convinced just because they find e coli 0153 and someone's got a bloody stool that it causes the bloody stool. Mm. And I just think that's retarded, man. I'm like, you find it in healthy people too. And I've never had any issues with my stools in my life ever. So, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. So I just think it's really funny, man. And I, I think when the episode comes out, I'll probably talk more about it in my streams and do like an actual post on it and, and bring up bring it up for discussion. But I'm like, you know, either way, if, if I want went in to get that that stool sample and i found nothing or i found something both ways it's really interesting you know i eat raw meat for four years and i have nothing in my system that's even more surprising or, oh, but now that i have something and i'm in perfect health in my life that's even more interesting to me but all you have is e coli and the e coli that they say that's pretty common in a lot of other people so it doesn't really indicate that there's a great difference in your overall gut biome, right? And no. like, there's nothing that's drastic. And yet they, they might try to harp on that, you know, E. coli just to make a big deal. Like they were doing with me with this blastocystitis. And it's a common organism and it's asymptomatic in a lot of people. And not only that, like we, we need to go down into the, I guess it's about time to go into the deep dive into germ theory and this whole trope that Mm -hmm. These microbes are the driving cause of disease, and they're not a corollary. Mm -hmm. When I believe wholeheartedly they're corollary, and they might be actually serving a biological function that's necessary, even if it's unpleasant. 
Like, you know, we can go back into the history of plagues. Like what they did was is they retroactively diagnosed these plagues in the past as conditions caused by bacteria and microbes, when in the past they had no idea what bacteria and microbes were. You know, they mm -hmm. called them ill humors, they called them, you know, the, the spirits, <laughs> the demonic possession, all these things, the dark horse of the apocalypse. I mean, all these things were not understood. And retroactively, I don't think they're understood either. Like for hundreds of years, people would die of cholera and probably thousands and thousands, but in recorded history, what was happening was as people were getting their drinking water mixed to their cesspool water. And so a lot of their waste was leaching into their drinking water. And uh, I think in England at, at a time, a, a private investigator was finding all these correlations. Well, there all these cases are in this one district where there's all drinking from one source of water. And then they isolated that source and they said, there's cholera in there. There's these little bacteria called cholera and that's what's causing everybody to be sick. And that, that now think about the cess water of uh, you know, Dickensian England. You're talking about coal ash. You're talking about industrial waste from the, the industrial plants, you know, all types of heavy metals, all types of biological metabolic waste. They had pigs running around the streets. I mean, literally, it was just this cesspoolic waste was going into their drinking water. And then the corollary organism was cholera. Yeah, there was cholera in there. But what was really making them sick? And why is it that subsequent experiments when they isolated cholera, you could take isolation of cholera, millions of them, and put them in fresh spring water, and I could drink them and probably not have a single symptom. Mm -hmm. But all the other biological waste that was the corollary in the environment where the cholera was thriving, then that is maybe what the prime driver of the disease was. And not only that, these people were not only living in their own waste, drinking their own wastewater, but what was the nutritional life like in these people? They were eating these moldy biscuits. Maybe if they had, were lucky, they had a piece of rancid meat. And uh, mm -hmm. there was this malnourishment was rampant. And so these people were coming down with, yeah, the diarrhea death, you know, the, and they called it cholera, and they blamed it on the microbe, when it was really the entire environment was, was just a horrific environment. Mm -hmm. And so they've been doing this time and time again from the beginning of recorded history. Back in the Black Death era, Europe had the thing called the Mini Ice Age, where all the wheat crops, because they had extra cold, rainy uh, falls, were getting inundated with this fungus, like, you know, blight. And they were eating the moldy grains on top of living in these hovels with rats who would eat their grains poop piss everywhere. And yeah, there were these fleas that had this toxic bubonic plague, but that maybe that wasn't the driving cause. Maybe the entire environment was actually what was the driving cause. And what history does is they drive these narratives based upon scapegoats. We don't want to talk about how everybody was living in unhealthy conditions. We want a scapegoat. We want something easy. Yeah. Okay, it was the flea on the rat that was biting people. But yeah. these people were so sick already, so nutritionally deficient, that they would succumb to the death of a bacteria on a flea bite. Mm -hmm. When somebody like me and you could get bit with that same flea and probably be fine. Mm -hmm. And yet they want to make it like this bacteria is the be all end all. Yeah. And then don't even get, get me started on viruses. <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll, we'll then we'll pause right there and we'll get into viruses yeah maybe we could do vi viruses at the very end or maybe you can cut it out because apparently you're not allowed to question the reality of uh, modern virality because they 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 coined the term virus back in the night early 1900s when they had these conditions they couldn't diagnose they had no idea they were looking under the microscope for a microbe that they could blame it on and they couldn't find it mm -hmm. and they're like it must be like this microbe that's so small and so you know just insidious that we don't even can't even find it so we'll just label it as a virus mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they've invented it out of whole cloth mm -hmm. and uh there's been there's conditions there's certain conditions that are real 
Yeah. You know, measles, mumps, rubella, smallpox. All these things are real, and I call them phenomenon. We can't really say that they are a virus because how would you know what it is? They see these little things. These, But honestly, I think that they're the tail end of a biological, immunological process. And they have not even begun to scratch the surface of understanding. Yeah, they, they, have no, they have no idea. And, and this, this, when you talked about cholera, that reminded me of something interesting. So when you were saying how, you know, cholera was in, uh, in the water and the water was polluted with all sorts of toxic stuff, um, they find the cholera and they say, oh, it must be cholera that's making you sick. And they just kind of stop there, right? Mm -hmm. And you said that, you know, you can drink a cup of cholera and we're not going to get sick, most likely. Like, it's not going to do anything to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, that reminds me of, uh, like, Koch's postulates. You've heard of that, right? Yeah. Okay, so Koch's postulates, for, for anybody that's listening that doesn't know it, I'll just go, I'll just read those real quick, and then we'll talk about that. So uh, Koch's postulates are, it's four postulates, and it's something that he designed basically for, for it's a criteria designed to establish a causal relationship between a microbe and disease. So the first one is, uh, uh, so you have to do these four postulates in order to determine if a microbe causes disease. So the first one is the microorganism must be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease, but should not be found in healthy organisms. And that's a callback to my E. coli 0153 thing. But number two, the microorganism must be isolated from a diseased organism and grown in a pure culture. Three, the cultured microorganism must, should cause disease when introduced into a healthy organism. And then four, the microorganism must be re-isolated from the inoculated diseased experimental hosts and identified as being identical to the original specific causative agent. So those four postulates right there, those are supposed to be the four things that scientists or doctors do to determine if a microbe such as, let's say, cholera, actually causes what they say cholera causes, right? And from my understanding, from everything that I know, nobody has ever done that. Nobody has ever done all four of those postulates. Is that right? That's, that's correct. And uh, they won't even try. Like, they won't even go halfway. <laughs> like, a lot of this stuff, it's just ad hoc. They just, like, when they were finding the, the root cause of a typhoid, it was some detective that just wanted to blame it on this, uh, you know, helper lady, um, Typhoid Mary. And she really didn't have anything to do with it, but because all these other people were getting sick around her, they did, were looking for a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. So they, this, they, they need a scapegoat. They need something to blame for it. And they're not really looking to, to get to the bottom of it because I think it's environment. I think there's other types of uh, factors that go into it that are just beyond the scope of their investigation to determine. And so they've given up <laughs> and they just... They won't go there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I find it fascinating, man. And most people don't know that. Most people don't know that they've never actually, you know, proved that uh, bacteria causes certain diseases at all. Uh, same thing with viruses. It's just, I think it blows people's minds, man, about how just kind of dumb all this is, you know? Now, what, but, uh, it, so now, like, go ahead. Now, I'll, I'll just, I, I just remember all the times, like, I, I'll cut myself. And then I'll have animal waste from guts and stuff into those cuts. Like, I, I cut myself all the damn time, like, working. And I have shards of metal, and like, I never get the tetanus. I never get infections, and, and everything yeah. seems to heal. And then we're reading in history books where somebody just gets a little paper cut, and it gets infected, and they die. And you're just like, there must be something dysfunctional with their immune system. And then the bacteria is just something that's uh, maybe uh, taking advantage of an already weak immune system and yeah, it's infiltrating and it's eating this tissue that is so toxic that it can't even defend itself. Mm -hmm. And so there is a correlation and yes, there is bacteria that will eat tissue and, and that will get into your body if you have a gaping cut that you don't tend your wound well and your body's already immune deficient. There's all these cofactors. And so, yeah, to, to say that bacteria have no effect or no place in a disease pathology is, is not 
really true either. But to say that it is at the top of the causation list is just dishonest. Yeah. And so, so I find it fascinating that it seems so obvious to me now that like toxins are causing like most of the disease today. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's malnutrition, there's toxicity, there's, there's direct injury. And then there's um, what I believe is like spiritual causes for disease as well, which is a whole nother topic that I don't see really anybody touching on, but I believe that's also a factor in disease is your uh, like spiritual trauma. But the three main ones are, you know, um, malnutrition, uh, toxicity and direct injury. Those I think are like the main three things that cause disease in people. And, um, and yeah, they just, they seem to like totally ignore the toxicity part of it. Nobody talks about that. And it's almost like you're, you're like, uh, you're, you're like some kind of weird hippie. If you're talking about like toxins, like they have, like you're some kind of fringe weirdo. If you're talking about toxins and toxicity and detoxification, some people don't even believe detoxification is, is actually a process of the body. I find that really interesting, man. And I find it interesting that like nobody thinks that like the toxins are what's causing the disease and it's actually like bacteria. I think there's becoming like a shift though. I think we're in the middle of that shift and it's starting to happen a little bit because people, I think, um, you know, the whole like vaccine thing is, is starting to sort of backfire on the whole powers to be because, you know, people are getting injured from that like crazy. And uh, people are going to start waking up to, I think, germ theory just from that alone, you know? Yeah. And we can go into Hodgkin's theory about, you know, how bacteria is there to eat the d diseased and toxic tissue. And it's, he yeah. called them cleansing agents. Yeah. And you know, it was a reduction for him to just call them cleansing agents and not really be able to expand upon it. But intuitively, he was right. I think that when mm -hmm. diseased tissue becomes so non viable, that it can no longer maintain its integrity, then yeah, these other organisms will come in, the yeast, the bacteria, the molds, the fungus, like, uh, you know, all these people have these yeast overgrowth syndromes and they think that, oh, if I can only just get rid of the yeast, then health issues will, will be, uh, you know, will subside, but they don't realize that that yeast is feeding off of these metabolites, these uh, unmetabolized, proteins and sugars and stuff in the body that your filtration organs can't get rid of. Mm -hmm. And so you, become, you get these so-called overgrowths, but they're not right. overgrowths. They're actually eating all the metabolic waste that your body's natural filtration systems can't eliminate. Yeah. And if your cells become so weak and sick and non-viable that they start getting a constant genetic damage. And this is where it ties into viruses. I think that, Ogenus had a hierarchy of detox and, you know, bacteria, molds, and funguses were on the lower end. And then what happens is when the cells become so toxic, and now think of our bodies as 50 trillion individual cells. And of the course of an average day, there's billions of them, you know, living and dying, being born and reborn and, and uh, metastasizing into all types of weird mutations. And what happens is, is when billions and billions of these cells simultaneously become so toxic to the point they can't properly replicate and the proteins start to get jarbled, uh, well, what happens to all these sick and diseased cells? They have, the body has to form a defense. And that's where I think uh, viruses come in. They call them viruses as if they're some type of alien invader from outside that are just sent to kill and destroy otherwise healthy cells mm -hmm. complete mm -hmm. boulder dash mm -hmm. you know all oxygen is called them solvents you know they dissolve sick and diseased tissues well how does the body eliminate that from you know when when they're part of us when mm -hmm. we have millions and billions of these cells that are no longer functionally viable they have to be eliminated and mm -hmm. this is detox you know this is what the detox is it's when you get a regular cold or a flu you get a fever, you get sometimes diarrhea, sometimes a cough, sometimes swollen glands and all these types of symptoms of inflammation. There's a cytokine storm, white blood cells are activated that you know act as a cleaners of the blood. And all this is just a giant symphony of biological action and reaction. And to reduce it to the, oh, it's just a little teeny strain of a virus that you picked up from somebody and that's why you're sick 
is insanity. It, it is beyond reductio ad absurdum to, to say that, you know, this one little strain of this messenger RNA signal, which is what I want to get into, is these things might be actually endogenously created in their functionary of our immune systems. They serve a biological function. Wake up. I've been listening to all these people that call themselves virologists, Robert Malone, and all these other types of uh, talking heads that are even on our side of it that think that people are going overboard with the viral mania. They still believe in this theory that viruses are pathogenic mm -hmm. and that they're some alien entity that are invading us. No, they are us. They're an extension of our immune system. Mm -hmm. Every living organism shares this messenger RNA signaling information. In the wombs of uh, mammals, the placenta is full of what they call retroviruses, which we don't really know what they are, but I believe that they're involved in modulating us genetically to make it so that we can bond. You know, two different organisms, when they come together to make one, Sometimes there's uh, sequences that don't quite link, link up. And so they need these viral repair cycles to be activated. Mm -hmm. And what they call the common cold, a coronavirus, is actually the majority of the so-called sequence that they say is the big scary thing is actually a part of our eighth chromosome. And it's activated in order to repair our DNA. When massive numbers of cells get damaged, you know, there is a potential, there's a capacity of the body through these latent mechanisms that they don't understand and they don't want to investigate, but these mechanisms activate and they send forth their messengers. And these messengers go into the cell and they don't necessarily kill it right away. If there's a repair that needs to be done, cells can repair themselves. Genetics can be repaired. There's these sequences hidden within us and they are us mm -hmm. and uh, they're not something that's alien something that needs to be suppressed and so let this happen let this biological function happen and the majority of people after they go through it after they go through a viral process they feel better mm -hmm. yeah, honestly we've all done it and I'm somebody mm -hmm. who can attest to it because of the history of my health problems because I was getting so ill Back before I found the raw meat diet, I was chronically ill, and I would go to the hospital day in and day out. Sometimes I'd have these episodes where I'd just flare up. I'd have all types of bodily inflammation and swollen glands and swollen lymph nodes, and I've had three occurrences where my neck is stiffened up, and I've been to the point where I can't hardly move. And I'd go into the hospital, and like, yeah, your white counts are a little high and your eosinophils are high, but we don't really know what it is. It's probably viral. And uh, I don't know how many times I've been told that. And I've even had spinal taps done and like, well, there's no bacteria. Well, it's probably viral meningitis. And they're just saying it's viral is saying like, we don't know what it is. Yeah. And so that's basically their go-to. And I've undergone so many viral episodes. I had chronic Epstein-Barr syndrome. I'd go in and I'd, I'd have a lot of tests done back when I was in my hypochondriac phase of chronic fatigue and sick all the time, yep. just looking for others. And so there was a time where I thought it was microbes. I did all types of investigation. Oh, I got this yeast overgrowth. And oh, yeah, I got these viruses that are constantly getting me. And I thought that it was pathogenic. And to the point where I realized, you know, when I started getting better with nutritional healing that, well, maybe these were actually a functionary of my immune system, desperately trying to kickstart into action, desperately trying to, to clean and purge. And these infections were actually a, a symptom of a, you know, a, a broader dysbiosis, mm -hmm. and not necessarily a cause of just being exposed to microbes that, you mm -hmm. know, are, are in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. I mean, I'm with you on all that stuff 100%. It's pretty crazy how backwards they all got it. <clears throat> and um, I used to hear that all the time growing up, too. Like, my mom, she would uh, she would get sick, and she would say, oh, well, it's just, it's probably something viral, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, that's just, like, such a common thing. And uh, you're right. It's just, like, 
they don't know what else to say, so they say it's viral. Uh -huh. It just sounds cool, sounds fancy, you know, it's kind of, it's almost like a spell, a little wizard spell. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it, it, it is. And, and I understand a lot of it because I've been reading and studying the deep science of it. I actually met Bruce Lipton. Uh, you know, he's the father of epigenetics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I've read some of his work and uh, like the last lecture that I saw of him, he was talking about the proteome, like this genetic science that has been thrown in our face for the last 20, 30 years. Oh, we got the human genome mapped. It's just a matter of time before we understand the secret of life. Mm -hmm. Well, not not exactly, because the, the genome is just a scaffolding. It's just mm -hmm. a basic structure, a blueprint that holds up what is actually the spirit of life itself, and that's the proteome. And so the genetic structure, this double helix, which isn't really a double helix, it's wrapped into a chromosome, and, and they break it into pieces and say, look what we did, look what we have. And they have no idea how these signals transmit into the form of life mm -hmm. and how they interact with each other, exchanging this so-called viral information. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's pure miraculous. I mean, it, it, you should be in awe of it. You shouldn't try to say you can even begin to understand it. That's the place where most people need to start. Yeah. But Bruce, brilliant as he is, he is trying to explain how it worked. And the, the sleeve proteins around the, the, the genome is the proteome. Mm -hmm. And so wrapped in these coils of these uh, electric energy crystals we call DNA, because that's what I believe they are. They're signaling electric energy and uh, fluctuating and sending these signals and beaming them across through the ether. It, it's this magical process, but and wrapped around that is the proteome that draws out the structure and then it transmits into the, the broader cell instructions. And the way it works is it, it runs around like a sleeve. Like there's a, what Bruce Lipton explained it is that the, the, the genome is enwrapped with the proteome, but the proteome can shift. And so it, according to the environment, it reads the environment. And if there's an environmental change, it can shift its position so that it can lock in and transmit signals from different places among the genome. Mm -hmm. And this is delicate dance. This is, and it's happening trillions of times per millisecond throughout your body and each and every one of your cells. And it's constantly moving, constantly fluctuating. And the idea that they can take something like CRISPR and just hack into it, take it or rip it apart, and then put something else in there and not interfere with that delicate sleeve of the protein, it, yeah. it, it's beyond insanity. It's barbaric, man. It's barbaric. And they're, they're, they're like playing God, basically. Yeah, playing God. That's what it is. And I don't think they're doing a good job of it. <laughs> no, they're not, dude. Yeah, they're and, not gonna. <laughs> that's not gonna end up well, I don't think. But the, if there's anything, uh, if there's anything in the religions that probably uh, talk about that, you know, playing God or or whatever, that's not a good idea. You know, it's all ego, man. It's all ego, and it's all just. It's they're they're just like so in the weeds. You know what I mean? And they're just like going over the obvious stuff. And they're just in the weeds, like you said, like trying to do CRISPR and like, you know, splice body parts together or whatever they're, whatever they're doing with that. You know, it's just way too off on the deep end, man. You know, and it's like, hey, let's go back to, how about we go back to Coke's postulates? How about we go back to that? And then try to start with that. You know what I mean? It's... But that, even that is, is just going off the tangent of everything being molecular and purely physical. And the fact that they don't, realize that our genetic structures are transmitters of a higher energy mm -hmm. and maybe even the mind of God creation itself, you know, the image of the creator life is that which creates itself. And we are each a piece of that mm -hmm. and that divine. And if you don't start out from that place, then it's very easy to become Frankenstein's monster. You know, this idea that Dr. Yeah. Frankenstein can just cut and paste pieces of life together to create whatever they can imagine right. Right. So. I know I, I know it's crazy man and that's where yeah it's like you got to look at the whole picture that's where religion and spirituality and all that stuff comes into play man it's all everything is all together it's all one thing you can't separate it you know you can't separate science 
from religion, from spirituality, from it's all one thing, man. It all plays in together, you know? So it's just all, it's all part of the story, you know? And that's why I think just being like, the people that can see you through this stuff are typically like whole brain thinkers, you know, you're using your left and your right side and you're kind of looking at things from, a, a, you know, an artistic way, a creative way, but you're also looking at things in a logical way. That's where I think you can see a lot of this stuff and, uh, you know, using your, your spiritual, your, your pineal gland or whatever to um, get that balance in there, you know? But um, so, yeah, so like, anyways, I was going to ask you also on the topic of like all this germ theory and stuff and parasites, like I always bring up, I'll be like, yeah, it's symbiotic. And like you said, Ogenesis theory about, you know, there's a hierarchy, and there's bacteria and, and molds and fungus and you have parasites and then you have like viruses at the top sort of. Um, but like someone will always like send me like a picture of like someone's eyeball with like a parasite, like a worm in it. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, how can this be cool? How can this be beneficial? You know? And, you know, I'm like, is, is that a parasite or is that just like a worm got on their body? You know what I mean? Like, I don't really know how to, how would you respond to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, it depends on the individual case. You know, there's people in very poor areas that have a, uh, poor like I said septic poor hygiene poor basic standard of living that might be exposed to some of these things and their bodies immune systems cannot cope and cannot defend themselves and that they are diseased and this is this is part of the natural process as well uh, yeah don't like saying the word Gaia because it has so many connotations with the hippy dippy new age movement but there yeah. is there is a something to the earth as an organism uh that, <laughs> and if we live as an organism you got to realize it has a defense mechanism so the earth like when there's too many people in one area and spoiling their own nest and fouling up their own drinking water the cholera and the disease and the plagues act as a way of uh, naturally balancing out the population and i'm not an overpopulationist i'm just saying that nature has a way of doing things and it's not always kind, it's not always fair, and it's not always something that we're willing to discuss in polite company. The fact that, you know, this earth is a living entity, and sometimes it doesn't like what we do, and sometimes it, it puts these uh, barriers upon us. Like, so if there's too many people living in too small of an area, and they're all living in their own filth and running around barefoot, maybe there are hookworms and different types of parasites that build up in that environment, and they act as a defense mechanism to pretty much, okay, either fix the way you're living, or it's time to go to the next world. And that's what's happened throughout history, not only in human life, in all of life. What happens for farm animals when you conglomerate a whole bunch of animals on a small area of land and then they're ruminant animals grazing in their own filth and then they pick up worms yeah. and and then they have you know these worm loads that are too much for them to naturally cleanse and purge and since they don't have free range to go seek out medicinal herbs and cleaner pastures they get inundated with the worms but are the worms part and parcel with the metabolic waste and the other biological toxins and right. these other conditions. Yeah. It's yeah, not yeah. just the worms. That makes sense. The worms, yeah. are, the worms are symptomatic of mm -hmm. a, a disease causing environment. And oh so, yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to, that's a great way to explain that, man. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, yeah, I think you nailed it there. And I've seen, um, I've, I've seen it firsthand because I go to the farms and I pick up these animals and animals that are living in small pens that are eating their own feces. They have spots in their liver often, even if they're natural so-called grass fed. And they have indications that they have some type of parasitic infection. And then I've seen other open range farms where there's only a few animals per acre and everything's pristine. And like, I mean, there's just a night and day difference in the taste of these things. I know. Not, not, yeah. not even talking about the, the, the downstream diseases. And so we have senses and we have the ability to observe and to, to see, and we have, well, most of us have the ability of mo 
mobility. And so if we're in an area or a place where the people are looking kind of not well and the animals aren't very healthy, well, then maybe you need to take some initiative and do something about it mm -hmm. and personal initiative. But that's off the table when we're talking about nation states and government and bureaucracies. They don't want people to take initiative over their own environment, take dominion over your own personal life. Mm -hmm. it, because that just doesn't fit into the structural hierarchy that's you know being built around us. Yep. But there is a way to mitigate, and there's there is diseased environments, and but don't look into the microbes as much as the whole environment. Very true, man. So, yeah. So just to switch gears a little bit here, um, I wanted to ask you also. So have you heard of the, uh, the Momentum Relax Far Infrared Sauna? Have you heard of that thing? Uh, yeah. It's like a tent, <laughs> and it goes like over your body, and your head sticks out. I, I had one. <laughs> oh, okay, I just, I just got one. So I was going to ask you what you think about those. those I, safe? I don't know if I had the exact same one, but I had one that looks exactly the same. But this was probably about 15 years ago or so. Uh, yeah, and, uh, they came out. They came out like two thousand five ish, mm -hmm. maybe two thousand three or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and it's, it's specifically it's far infrared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes you sweat. It's like a whole hot box sweat sauna. Right. But yeah. Deep tissue. So what's, your, tissue. what's your take on that? So like, I, for, from all my research on it, it seems like it's okay. Like I know the whole Ogenus crew says saunas aren't good, but I think that's typically when it's heating up your head. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the bad thing is when it's heating up your brain and it's also getting into your mucous membranes. But uh, this one, your head's out of it. And I know it's like great experiences with it. I don't know if I've ever talked to you specifically about, well, I know you have a sauna in your, in your guest house. Yeah, it's a far infrared sauna, but it's like one of those cedar box ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and I have a light machine you... with the, you know, the yeah, different frequencies of the red light. Uh, yeah. Here's my take on saunas. I bought a sauna back... I was going through my issues with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome because I thought I was inundated and I probably was with, with toxins. I was a commercial electrician. I was exposed. I worked in houses with a lot of lead. I had a lot of uh, heavy metal exposure, which uh, I was tested. I got hair analysis for, and I had, you know, lead, cadmium, nickel, all these types of trace metals were off the charts and my selenium and my good minerals like magnesium were all low. And so I had these imbalances and these toxicities. And so I was really, really bad off for a long time. And I was trying to figure out what to do. And this is the, okay, I need to detox. Mm -hmm. The only problem is, is at the time I wasn't nourishing myself properly. So like I had yeah. to go through these saunas and also eat mostly vegetables and, you know, that yeah. thing and you end up detoxing all the good stuff out with the bad. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, that there's a certain balance point. And I have a sauna and every now and then, yeah, I'll feel like I'm kind of exposed or feel like I'm just need to sweat it out. And uh, yeah, I'll go into it. But the other issue is, is I just was so unbalanced with my electrolytes for so long that I couldn't do the sauna too much because I never was one for adding salt and I was never one for eating a lot of potassium containing, you know, vegetables and foods. So I, you know, I had a lot of uh, mineral issues and then I had low calcium, low magnesium. So what happens is if you sweat like that, you got to, and you do it regularly, you got to make sure that you can uh, balance your electrolytes in order to remineralize or else you'll end up depleting yourself. Mm -hmm. and so there's a certain balance to it. And uh, there is a place place for it, especially people who are transitioning and they're trying to really get rid of all these toxins and maybe they're going into toxic overload. You know, they're trying to transition from a cooked, sad based diet to a raw meat diet. There are places yeah. for a lot of these things, I think. Yeah. And uh, I've gotten to a point now where I think that I need it as much. And uh, I've found another way to rebalance my electrolytes and uh, now, I probably haven't talked to you about this since your hair analysis and so on. Yeah. Like we, we can talk about it because I've, you know, I've talked to other people at, about this and I've recommended hair analysis to this uh, one lady in Argentina that has a, a 
like thyroid issues and all types of like these strange fatigue syndromes. And I was just like, you got to have a hair analysis. This sounds like heavy metals. Yeah. And, it, and it came back and like she was through the roof in uranium. Yeah, you told me about it. I remember you telling me about her. Yeah, so this is like, okay, in the thyroid disorder and going to the doctor and they're, they're like, yeah, your thyroid hormone's low, but we don't know why. <laughs> And then, you know, you go get a hair analysis. Well, the mainstream medicine doesn't acknowledge that they're accurate. And, yeah, there might not be up to this gold standard that they hold everything to. But it's an indication if you got a lot of uranium in your body, <laughs> there might be something wrong. And so what do you do, though? Like, you know, I had a lot of mercury fillings. I had a lot of uh, my aluminum levels were through the roof. And, you know, working as a commercial electrician and exposed to a lot of stuff is like, well, what do you do <laughs> to, to try to mitigate some of that? Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to find ways to do it, and it hasn't been easy. And I don't believe in the full chelation route. I think that, you know, those types of therapies can sometimes cause more harm than good. They can move the toxins around and not really get them out of the body. Mm -hmm. So I, there's natural chelation that you can do on a subtle level first of all purification for food quit getting the input okay just whatever the external sources are limit yourself like i used to work bare hands working with metal all the time i got cotton glove inserts that i'll wear over like a nitrile gloves you know get cotton inserts and then just make sure i don't touch the heavy metals and the stuff that i used to just you know, go barehanded you know, and get all types of things like pcbs and the plastics and all that it your skin's permeable and so you know, if you're working in a dusty environment you know then one time i'll recommend people to wear a mask is if you're in a commercial environment and there's a lot of dust and then yeah wear a good quality dust mask yeah, <laughs> yeah or, I wear a mask all the time or, you're in a fumy environment you know where or make sure you have a ventilation fan just simple ventilation can, can help uh, you know reduce your exposure to toxicity and then through the course of purification by diet clean like fat like the mm -hmm. fat of the land pure grass fat that comes from good land and then over time you know you can naturally get your detoxification organs back in shape so that they will clean mm -hmm. the blood. They'll do the work for you. You don't need a whole lot of other input. And uh, I've been doing something recently that's been working pretty well. I've been supplementing with coral calcium. Like I get this powdered coral cal calcium that's it's heavy metal tested and it's it's the high end stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I've been taking like maybe a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of it a day with uh, my regular mix of a raw egg, a little bit of lemon juice. And from time to time, I've actually been chewing on some uh, coriander seeds, you know, the cilantro seeds. They say cilantro mm -hmm. is good for the heavy metal detox. When I, when I was used to trying it at first, back when I was, you know, new and not knowing what I was doing, I'd eat a whole bunch of it. And, oh, my God, it would just, it'd be too much. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, dislodging the heavy metals and not really flushing them from the body. But, like, a little teaspoon or half a teaspoon of coriander seeds along with the coral calcium the lemon juice and egg to kind of buffer and remineralize and that's the thing it, it don't do it intense you don't have, have to do intense detoxes you can do things on a subtle level and maybe that's the best approach to not try to just oh, i need to get everything out of my body right now no, no, you need to build your body, build your nourishment, and subtly, mm -hmm. <laughs> incrementally clean yourself, and the tissues will regenerate, and your body will purify. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, doing this coral calcium with a little bit of uh, coriander seeds, and my girlfriend was making this stuff that was, it. Now, I don't do a lot of vegetables, but I was pickling avocados. Like, you can take a, a wine vinegar, like, white wine vinegar with a little bit of garlic coriander seeds and unripe avocados or avocados that are slightly uh, ready to go you can you can pickle them <laughs> and uh i've been eating some of that and i think it's good for prebiotic fiber and it's good for the basic uh overall gut balance mm -hmm. and just a little bit you know if the
just a pickled avocado every now and then. Mm -hmm. And with the coriander seeds, there's just something in it. I was pickling this avocado and I was like, coriander. <laughs> it's just the most outrageous thing to think about it. Cause it but I was, I've been eating it for a while and I, I think I've been able to come overcome a lot of the, the heavy metal damage that I had. And it, it's hard to talk about these things because when you talk about heavy metal damage, you know, it's done damage to your mind. Yeah. You know, it's done damage to your yeah. ability to, to think and all those years of fog and all those chronic migraine headaches I used to have. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, intense symptoms and intense viral episodes. And it's chronic fatigue, this Epstein-Barr syndrome. A lot of these all go hand in hand with metal toxicity. And it's just not diagnosed. It mm -hmm. will not be diagnosed. They will not admit that there's a problem. <laughs> and you go to a medical doctor for years and they won't acknowledge it. Because the blood testing that they do, in order for you to show toxic on a blood test, you have to be either immediately exposed within the first few days of a, a high exposure or just chronically exposed with such a high amount that it even throws the blood off. Mm -hmm. Because your body will do everything it can possibly do to keep the blood levels of toxic metals to a minimal, and it will store them into your tissues. And so deep stored into the tissues, and then they, they leach out over time, causing chronic symptoms. But a lot of times, if it's mild exposures over long periods of time, it will never reach a threshold to where you can get a clinical diagnosis. And yeah. that's what's happening with the entire civilized world. We're being inundated with these industrial toxins and pollutions, part of this modern industrial society we live in. And they've mitigated a lot of the, the issues of the past, you know, in the Dickensian days when they were just doing coal smokestacks everywhere and everybody was inundated with mercury and, and lead and other heavy metals to at an absurd level, like when they were putting lead in the gasoline. And mm -hmm. so they've, they've actually done some job to clean it up, but nowhere near to the level of what we would consider optimal. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so you got to do that on your own i don't think you can trust any government regulatory agency to tell you what the safe levels of heavy metals are yeah and that's like one question i had when i got my uh <clears throat> my test done which I'm, I'm looking at right now but like they have this like blue wavy line that goes through the middle and that's supposed to be like normal range <laughs> but I'm and like, is that i don't know yeah. what normal is but the other thing is, is that's that's only on the vitamins and minerals when you go down to the toxic metal part there's just it just goes from like, let's say on like aluminum, it goes from zero to four. Mm -hmm. And I'm right at like 2.7. Four is like the top. And then see, I, when I was so, my initial testing, when I was uh, sick, my aluminum was at a seven. Okay. And so like, so, it was off the chart. And so like I had, I had severe and I used to cut metal conduit. And I used to work in this uh, MC cable. And a lot of, I'm an electrician, so I worked with all this stuff in, in the commercial side of things, and I just wasn't aware of how toxic these things were, and I was exposed to it and not doing what I should do to mitigate the exposure. So, you know, I, I found out the hard way well, about I'm, it. I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering, because I work in a shop right now, and, like, and I work in a metal shop, but everything we work with is it's hollow metal steel. Mm-hmm. It's cold rolled steel, um, but we're around like I'm around welding quite a bit, and I weld a little bit myself. But I usually wear a, uh, actually always wear a uh, respirator. Um, but I'm around like the smoke. Mm -hmm. Is is any of it galvanized or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you got to ventilate. I mean, and I, my stepdad was a welder. Worked for. A, a, company and sometimes he would just be back in the shop and he would just get inundated and be sick for two or three days have to sleep it off and it's something that you know, the body can build up a tolerance to and you can eliminate it just mitigate limit this exposure <laughs> just try yeah. not to try. that's what you know we we usually uh unfortunately in the winter we got the doors closed but usually nine months out of the year we got all the shop doors open and it's always being ventilated out but mm -hmm. um so I think we're we're pretty good, but I'm curious. Is that I'm gonna I'm gonna do a test in probably like another year, 
after I do this sauna every single day. And I'm going to see if it drops those two things down. Because it was my mercury and my aluminum were the only ones that were, they were sort of right in the middle, almost two thirds all the way up. Uh, just a little bit of lead, just like one little sliver of lead, but no cadmium, no arsenic. And uh, the only thing on my minerals that were a little bit low was my magnesium and my copper, which really surprises me because I eat liver and uh, oysters all the time. What about so, selenium? Was your selenium? Uh, selenium was about the same as my magnesium as far as like a little, just a little bit below where they say normal is. Yeah. I've gone, I've tried from time to time to supplement selenium because, uh, I eat mostly sheep and, uh, from sheep from land animals, uh, the selenium's pretty low. And so I actually, you know, one of the few supplements I'll take is like a little bit of selenium, a little bit of iodine because uh oh yeah <laughs> you got it on the yeah uh-huh yeah so you're a little on the low side with the copper and selenium yeah selenium can help mitigate the mercury yeah. mm -hmm. but the problem is is how much to take and i'm not one to to suggest taking a whole whole lot because you can go off the deep end on the other side you mm -hmm. gotta figure out kind of what works best for you yeah and i i had high mercury account like a, a few years back i don't have it with me but i think i was eating a lot of shellfish and just getting a lot of you know and so that mercury can be transient like it, it'll come and go yeah okay that makes sense yeah like like uh because audrinus did those experiments on raw fish and he found that like you know when you eat raw fish the mercury gets expelled out with with the raw fats and everything so yeah I would say, like, I'm, I've, been, I've been eating a lot of swordfish. I don't know if that was boosting my mercury up like temporarily. Yeah, swordfish is one of the swordfish is one of the you know toxic fish, isn't it? Like on the mercury list. So it I, is. It is. Yeah, but I don't know what to make of that because I, you know, Ogenus's whole study where he did, he said that if you eat it raw, then it's supposed to come out. You know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like I said, I've been able to mitigate and eliminate from high levels, and I've seen like a year later and all the levels go down normal. So, yeah, you just kind of have to see what works good for you. And I, that's one reason why I don't eat a lot of fish. Uh, I've had mercury issues in the past, and what I've noticed is if I get too much mercury, I have like a little eye twitch. I'll get uh, migraine headaches. Yeah. And so I, I know it's like a nerve thing that's uh, being triggered. Yeah. And just from experience, I know where it is, what it yeah. is. So but it's, it's well, uncharted territory because like a lot of this stuff isn't mainstream. They won't diagnose you. You know, you can go in there with mild toxicities and they'll never in a million years admit it that you're mildly toxic in something until your point of your organs are failing and then <laughs> but if you're just you know having these symptoms bad headaches uh, twitches you know neurological issues just brain yeah. fog, all this stuff that's, that that's millions, exactly where they want you right millions yeah millions you know, of people just, and it's a little bit dumbed down and kind of twitching yeah. a little bit and then they got to control over you and yeah drink the tap water with the fluoride which they still add <laughs> fluoride's a neuro toxin it, it always was yeah nothing changed just because I, the dentists yeah. say it helps for tooth cavities which it doesn't it's it's a lie and it always yeah. has been a lie fluoride's one of the main ingredients of prozac it's known to just anesthetize and tranquilize you at small doses and at higher doses yeah. it just wreaks havoc on your endocrine system and so get it out of the water and if you yeah. can't get it out of your your tap water try to at least drink spring water from good sources out of glass bottles yep you know glass bottles absolutely that's what i drink buddy well cool man i think we covered a lot dude and uh i think it'd be a good time to maybe uh to maybe leave it for now and then we can we can do yeah. another one if you'd like <laughs> yeah, we, be free. we come, we come around and uh man there's there's up to the horizon and beyond i have so many ideas that i really want to get out and there's so much else going on in my life behind the scenes that you know maybe we won't mm -hmm. get into today but yeah over sure. the course of the 
few months, maybe we could do a couple more. And, sure, man. Just, and if, yeah. if your people have questions, yeah, you can just maybe get a list of questions, you know, and I could just go through them. Sure. <laughs> there's a lot more that I, I have up here that maybe just hasn't come to mind yet. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, sounds good, man. Yeah. And I always have a bunch of questions of my own. So yeah, dude, we'll just, uh, we'll stay in touch. And then uh, maybe after the holidays, maybe put something together, get together. Yeah. Again. Yeah. That'd be great. All right, man. Well, well uh, Hey, I appreciate you coming on, man. And uh, everybody else does too, I'm sure. So I wish you a uh, Merry Christmas, man, you and your family. All right. Have a Merry Christmas. Right. I'm going down to Florida. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Sweet. Well, I'm Good leaving uh, the Christmas, the day after Christmas, Monday at three o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning, I'm packing up the kids and just driving down to the Gulf Coast mm -hmm. and I kind of leave this Arctic weather behind. I've That's been doing it for a years and I just, it's my Christmas present to the kids yeah. because, you know, I don't, I'm not a super materialist. I think that the memories and the adventure that we're going to go on is probably more valuable than anything that you can wrap up and put under a tree. That's a good idea, man. That's a really good idea. I like that. And so, yeah, I, I, I got my freezer packs ready. I got these uh, like pound and a half packs of meat frozen and a little maybe half pound packs of fat. And I'll keep that in a cooler. And then that's, when I'm down there, I'll, I'll get some local fish and stuff like that and just supplement. And it usually works out pretty good. Sweet. Well, cool, man. Well, uh, yeah, safe travels and everything. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you when you get back. Yeah. And, like, invite me out to your wedding. Maybe we can have a... a yeah. if you, hey, man, I, I would love to invite you. I just didn't know if you would make it up here. But you, you'll get an invitation for sure, man. Yeah. I, no promises. But when when is it? It's April 1st. Oh, okay. It's a Saturday. Saturday afternoon. All right. And they got cabins. They got cabins and stuff there you can rent. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, man, I'll send them out to you and we'll see what happens. All right. Yeah. Congratulations on everything. And maybe we can do another one after your uh, My Strange Addictions come out. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. Can let's, talk definitely, about it. let's definitely do that because that's going to be interesting. That's a whole other rabbit hole we'll get into. But. We don't know exactly the format because yeah, they gave me the same spiel they gave you. It's like, no, it's not like one of these, uh, you know, they're just making fun of you. They're wanting you to tell your story yeah. and they'll give it perspective so let's just see how honest they were in the pitch yeah exactly and and also like i caught myself because they were feeding me a lot of lines um but he he had already interviewed me for like a couple hours so he knew kind of where i stood on everything but he would sort of rephrase what i already said into something that sounded a little bit better for the camera yeah. and i caught i caught myself a couple times saying things that i i wouldn't have said so that it gets very tricky when you get on the television and you have someone that's really good behind the camera feeding you lines because you'll end up saying shit that you didn't exact you didn't word it the way you wanted to so i hope that doesn't come out wrong on the show but we'll see but anyway well, yeah. regardless of how it comes out like i was extremely impressed of, with ogenus bonder planets when he did uh the ripley's believe it or not yeah Mom actually yeah. saw that before I even knew about raw meat, and she is telling me about it. And yeah, but you know, just regardless of what they how they were trying to paint him, the way he just sat there and ate his meat and looked like yeah. he was cool as hell with it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the picture's worth a thousand words. Like, so even if you know they don't allow you to say everything you need to say, if you can get up there and you know eat a piece of meat and just I know be cool. I know that's all it takes, right? Yeah, message exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good night. All right, brother. Have a good evening, man. All right. Later Peace. On. Peace out.